right, hello everybody. Today we are going to be finishing up our notes for unit two about constellations and scientists or astronomers. So get out your note packets, follow along, fill in the rest of your notes. So today we're gonna to finish up talking about Newton's law of gravitation. So on Monday we talked about Newton's three laws, kind of showed a little bit of a video about that. So quickly we're gonna watch a video about Newton's universal law of gravitation. Science in a Minute, presented by NSF GK12 at the University of Cincinnati. Sponsored by AAAS. The Earth and the Moon have existed for approximately four and a half billion years. And during that time, the Moon has been orbiting the Earth in a choreographed circular dance. What is not so evident is that the Earth and the Moon are in a violent game of tug and war, each aggressively pulling on each other. The Moon's pull is evident in the rise and fall of tides in Earth's oceans. But what dictates this relationship? Sir Isaac Newton mathematically modeled this relationship and is referred to as Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation. Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation states that the force of gravity between two objects is equal to the universal gravitational constant times the mass of each object, all divided by the square of the distance between the two objects. G represents the universal gravitational constant. M1 and M2 are the masses of the two objects. R is the straight line distance between the centers of the two objects. The gravitational force is proportional to the product of their masses. So as the product increases, so does the gravitational force. Likewise, as the product decreases, so does the gravitational force. The force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Thus, as the distance increases, the gravitational force decreases, and vice versa. Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation Okay, so what that's basically saying is the larger the mass of the object, or the two objects, the stronger that pull of gravity is going to be, the smaller those ob mass of objects are going to be, the less gravity there will be, and then it is always proportional to uh, distance as well. So the farther away they are, the less gravity there is, the closer they are, the more gravity. So uh, astronauts in free fall. So while in space, astronauts are falling freely, uh, so they experience weightlessness. Um, so uh, you can see in this picture a whole bunch of different astronomers um, in the uh, International Space Station, and they see what is known as weightlessness, or we see as no gravity, because of how far away it is from the gravitational pull. And since the masses are different, it's going to be feeling as if they are free falling, or they're going to be experiencing weightlessness. Uh, we have planes that can go really high into our atmosphere, and then they go basically into a nosedive, and that's where people can experience this weightlessness. And in reality, you're just free falling. Um, eventually, when a plane needs to go back up, uh, you will fall back down onto the surface, and then uh, you'll be stuck back down by gravity. Uh, so our solar system orbits. So we see the orbits of a typical comet and asteroids compared to those of planets Mercury and Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. So the black circles are the planets. The blue is going to be uh, your asteroids, and then the red is going to be your comets. So asteroids tend to be a little bit bigger than comets as they go across. So as you can see, there are different shapes of orbits that they go around. As you can see, the planet ones, for the most part, are close to circular. They're still in a little bit more of that egg shape for their, or their ellipse, or the eclipse, but um, their orbits are a little rounder compared to those of uh, comets because of the gravitational pull is going to slingshot them away and they're going to fly a lot faster and that gravitational pull is a little bit stronger. And so depending on their size is going to depend on what that shape is going to be. Uh, this will be on your test on Friday. So this is talking about the different planets as they go and talking about their eccentricity. So comets generally have orbits of larger size and greater eccentricity and those of asteroids. Typically, the eccentricity of the orbits is 0 0.8 or higher, according to Kepler's second law. Therefore, they must spend, or they spend most of their time far from the sun and move very slowly. As they approach the perihelion, the comets speed up and whip through parts of the asteroids more rapidly. 
So the closer to zero they are, the more circular that eccentricity or their orbit is going to be. So as you can see, um, a lot of these have a pretty large, so like Mercury is 0 0.21 eccentricity, Venus is 0 0.1, so overall has a very circular orbit, so does Neptune. Um, you can also see like Mars will have a relatively weird shape for eccentricity, but Mercury is probably the worst off and the most weird shape of all. It also shows their periods and years for how long it takes them to orbit or to go around the sun. So you can see the Earth we know is one year or one period. Mercury obviously travels the fastest. It has the shortest distance around the sun. Uh, and then it'll go all the way as high as Neptune, who has the largest uh, orbit around the sun. And then you can see the semi-major axis. That we don't really worry about. But the eccentricity part will be on there. So the closer to zero, the more circular in shape their orbit will be. So overall, uh, Venus and Neptune have two of the most circular orbits or have the least amount of eccentricity. Okay, so uh, what happens if you fire a bullet into orbit? So what we know of uh, Newton's laws, in an ideal world, if we threw an object and there was no gravity, no friction, nothing, that should continue all the way back around. It should continue in a straight line forever and ever and ever. But obviously we have gravity, we have friction, we have air, it's going to affect the overall movement of an object. So uh, for A, for path A and B, the velocity is not enough to prevent gravity from pulling the bullet back to Earth. In case C, the velocity allows the bullet to fall completely around the Earth. So it's basically how fast is something moving is also going to affect the overall gravity to it. So if it's going to go really slowly, it's going to fall down pretty quickly like um, velocity A. If we add a little more velocity to it, a little more speed, it's going to get all the way to B. It would have to be a very high amount of velocity to be able to get it to go all the way around Earth. So section B shows that the diagram by Newton in his book that shows basically the same concept that depending on where we're at on earth if you didn't add enough velocity it will not go around but then the more velocity you add the more it'll go around uh, an object will go around in an orbit uh, satellites that also orbit earth so we have a ton of satellites up in our atmosphere and just outside of our atmosphere that holds all of our satellites for communication, for internet, um, telescopes, and ways we can send pictures back of Earth. So this picture shows large pieces of orbit debris that has been tracked by NASA in the Earth's orbit. So NASA has to keep track of these things um, just so that we know, one, what's out there, and two, if things something fails or it comes crashing down because it's no longer an operation and it has a chance of hitting a certain area of land, then we need to know where it's going to go so we can warn people around there. Uh, obviously, the majority of the Earth is water, so we generally don't have to worry about it. Uh, but there are times where they may give out a warning of like, hey, there's debris falling. Most debris is going to burn up in our atmosphere as it's coming back down anyway. So again, not a major concern, but it's good to know and keep track of where all of this debris and all of these satellites are. So that if something were to happen, we can pinpoint it from there. Um, we also have modern computers. So these supercomputers by NASA, Ames Research Center, are capable of tracking the motion of more than a million objects under their multiple gra gravitation. So these computers are full of information and are tracking multiple things in our night sky, especially satellites um, and anything basically that's moving around. Um, earth and or in our solar system's cycle <laughs> or solar system's orbits um, and keeping track of exactly for so example like Halley's Comet uh, we're keeping track of where that's at so we can let people know so they can view it uh, meteor showers um, solar flares things like that that are coming through 
If you ever see the movie Hidden Figures, um, they were the original supercomputer. They were the ones calculating and coming up with a de- or coming up with the math to track where things are in the night sky. So uh, you'll see if you ever watch the movie you'll see these kind of hidden or these supercomputers start coming into play later on in their careers. And they are the main people kind of in charge of these computers and making sure that they are doing their jobs. Okay. Uh, we also have some mathematicians who discovered a planet. So John Couch Adams and Urbane J. Fair, uh, they share credit for discovering Neptune. So they were actually going through the math of the distance of planets And they noticed that there was a separation and something beyond Saturn. And they're like, well, what could this be? Well, they went through the math and they actually were able to see that there was a planet. And they predicted Neptune. And so later on, many years later, once we got strong enough telescopes and things like that, they were actually able to see that Neptune was a real planet. So they were able to predict it using math. So here is the discovery of Neptune. Hi guys and welcome to Brain Snacks. My name is Clara and in this channel I would like to share my fascination about science and technology. The first episode is about the discovery of Neptune. There are just a few places on Earth from where a planet was discovered. Recently I found out that I used to live close to the discovery location of Neptune. Neptune was discovered in 1846 by the German astronomer Johann Galle after the French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier calculated where to find it. Let's see what's left of the observatory today. Now I'm standing close to the exact location where Johann Galle looked at the night sky through his telescope. Right behind me, that's the Jewish Museum, and this building already existed at the time of the Berlin Observatory. Unfortunately, of the observatory itself, there's nothing left today, except for an information panel with the ground plan, and explaining that on the wall of the observatory, there used to be a reference benchmark for the sea level. This is how the Star Observatory looked at the time when Neptune was discovered. Here we have the astronomer Johann Galle, and the mathematician Urbain Le Verrier. But I think that everyone should know that from here a planet was discovered. We should put a flag here. But wait, didn't I bring one? But before we find out how this actually happened, here are some facts about the planet. Neptune is the farthest known planet from the Sun in our solar system. It is the fourth largest planet by diameter after Uranus, Saturn and Jupiter. Neptune is 17 times as massive as Earth and 58 Earth volumes could fit in it. Its average distance from the Sun is 4.5 million kilometers. One Neptune day is 16.1 hours And one Neptune year, so the time that Neptune needs for a whole orbit around the Sun, is 164.8 years on Earth. This is NASA's spacecraft Voyager 2, the only spacecraft that visited Neptune and took close pictures of it and its satellites. Neptune has 14 known moons. Triton, its biggest moon, has some very interesting characteristics. Its orbit goes in the opposite direction of the orbit of its planet. This is called a retrograde orbit. Moreover, the orbit is inclined relative to Neptune's equator, which suggests that Triton did not form in the orbit around Neptune, but was gravitationally captured by it. But how did the mathematician and the astronomer discover the planet? Well, long before they did, already other astronomers, like Galileo Galilei, had seen Neptune through a telescope. But they didn't identify it as a planet. The actual discovery started with another planet, Uranus. In 1846 it was known that Uranus, the closest planet to Neptune, had irregularities in its orbit around the Sun. The theory to explain this of Urbain Le Verrier was that there had to be another planet farther out in the solar system that influenced Uranus gravitationally. With the data of Uranus' orbit, he calculated where to find this unknown planet. Then he informed Johann Galle in Berlin, 
who discovered Neptune within one degree of its theoretically calculated position. This makes Neptune a planet that first had been theoretically predicted and then had been actually discovered. Isn't that cool? Thank you very much for watching and if you liked it, please hit the Neptunian subscribe button to share my fascination. Alright, so that was a little bit about Neptune and how ne Neptune was discovered. Okay, and this is our very last slide. So as we construct an ellipse by pushing two tacks, uh, so those whiteboard objects, into a piece of paper on a drawing board, then loop a string around the tacks. Each tack represents a focus of the ellipse, with one of these tacks being the sun. Stretch the string tight around the pencil and then move the pencil around the tracks. The length of the string remains the same so that the sum of the distance from those two points of the ellipse to the foci is always constant. So that's a way to be able to draw an ellipse depending on what are the actual foci. So again, each of those little white dots there are a foci. One of them would be considered the sun and then it would be able to create an equal distance in between each one to keep your ellipse shape. Uh, by using the string to be able to draw it appropriately. All right, so that's all I have for you today. Uh, make sure you have all your notes filled out. If you want to go through the Quizlet, I highly recommend that. Get some practice in. Get you ready for your test on Friday. Tomorrow we're going to do some review games. Um, and then same thing on Thursday. If you have any questions, let me know. Also start miss working on any missing work from Unit 2. So make sure you find something to do. If you need uh, some extra work to do, because you can't find something to do, there is a, another starry night you can do, but it is not homework, only if uh, the sub feels like you need something to do. So have a great rest of your day, and I will see you tomorrow.